so yeah, I've just started, so I'm going to discuss sort of the ideas of my research with you. Ooh, there we go. Um, so I'm going to discuss archaeological studies of food to date, how humoral theory relates to food, give an outline of my project, um, some potential outcomes I might get, and give a summary of my argument. So archaeological studies of food to date have taken a really isolationist approach. So animal bones have been studied separately, plant remains, and there's very little integration of historical evidence. And interpretations have just really focused on economics of production or simplistic ideas of social identity. So is this high or low status? And the contemporary mindset has been completely ignored. And as you'll guess, um, the mindset of my time, early modern period, is humoral theory. So I'm just going to go over a bit again what Richard and Naomi have been through. So um, Bullion in 1595 says that good health lay in the balance of the humours. And Bohr discusses in this quote how diet was the main factor in determining health. Um, so plants and animals possess their own humoral uh, makeup and temperament and they were categorised into the humoral scheme primarily based on flavour but other factors were important and this included colour so if they were red they were seen as really hot and foods were given the qualities of hot, cold, moist or dry and these had sort of degrees of intensity so if you can recall their, their diagram earlier the first degree up to the fourth and the first degree had a marginal effect on the body and the fourth degree powerfully altered it and foods were also either crass or subtle and that's hard or easy to digest so I've got an example up and colworts this is the lovely cabbage um, and Kogan in 1636 describes them as hot and dry in the first degree and if they be eaten last after a meal they preserve the stomach from suffering so what this means to us is basically it'll heat and dry the body this will cause the passages to dilate and food to pass through really quickly and exit you quickly <laughs> <laughs> um, so most foods um, like cabbage tended to lean towards this a certain humour and you could alter the constitution by uh, cooking or preparing them in a certain way and adding herbs and spices that were of the fourth degree and few foods were well tempered and bread and chicken uh, a few examples I have a bit of a difference with your chicken but I'll go with bread then so bread uh, Vargan describes as it's made of pure wheat flour um, it's strength to the heart makes man fat and preserves health so it's this really good balanced thing it's, it's good for everyone and a healthy diet was based on the assumption that similar foods to a person's nourish and opposites correct and a diet varied for every individual depending on their character sex age and the season of the year so I've got an example up and this is for a melancholic man. Uh, melancholics were deemed cold and dry and these are really quiet, analytical, serious people. Um, so they're told, refrain from fried meat and don't eat salty things and instead you should eat cow's milk and boiled meat. So I really hope I'm not a melancholic because I love a fry up. <laughs> Um, so these quotes that I've, I've been talking to you are all from the contemporary dietary literature and there's loads of it. So this is a really popular topic at the time. And Al Bala in 2002 has looked at this literature and he describes really important changes in the style of the writing and he puts them into phases. So the first phase, 1470 to 1530, this is written for the courtier. Authors have principally patronage and there's very few guidelines. It's all very loose. Basically, eat what tastes good for you. This will be most similar and therefore most nourishing and this is based on Jewish and Arab authorities such as Avincenna and then the second phase 1530 to 1570 Galen comes back everybody loves him and this is partly to do with the revival and the translation of his texts and these loose guidelines are replaced by urgent warnings don't trust your body only eat foods approved by the experts and the third phase 1570 to 1650 get rid of the ancients it's personal experience and local custom that's taking the fall and this is partly um when sort of ideas and progress in studies of anatomy are being made and theories about how the body's working are coming to the fore but medical practice doesn't keep up with this ideas about humoral theory and diet continue and after 1650, this dietary literature sort of declines because the scholars are becoming interested in everything else. But humoral theory and diet is still happening. So I'm going to be using a case study um, to look at my work. And this is Bradgate House, and it's an aristocratic household in Leicestershire. And the School of Archaeology and Ancient History in um, University of Leicester is doing this as a five-year project. And we're about to go into our second year. 
So Bradgate House was home to the Grey family. Construction began around 1490, completed 1520, and went out of use around 1720. And the Greys are a really interesting family. They're in and out of favour with the Crown all the time. They're in the Tower. Um, really good. And a notable member is Lady Jane Grey, so the famous nine-day queen. And I think they're a really good case study because they're wealthy, so they've got choice over their food, and they're at the height of fashion. So I hope they're going to be following this new trend because Bradgate House is one of the first um, brick-built houses in England. So I've got my uh, research statement up there. I won't bore you by reading it out. But the main way I'm going to tackle it is firstly by establishing what was consumed at Bradgate House. So I'm going to analyse the animal bones and the plant remains and quantitatively integrate the data. And I'm going to compare this to the extant uh, Grey family records. So I've got a household account book dating to the late 17th century and says what they've bought in. And um, it's just kitchen staff, but it also says about cabbage nets and things so you can infer. And that should hopefully give me a complete view of what was being eaten. I'm then going to compare this to other Leicestershire sites uh, to see if it's percolating down, as we've uh, discussed before. And this will be urban, rural and ecclesiastical and other English and arist aristocratic sites to contextualise this. And then I'm going to look um, and understand the humoral values to give them to food and how these changed over time, drawing upon primary documentary sources. And I'll mainly focus on dietaries, but also of interest to me will be paintings, um, plays and cookery books. And then um, compare this information with the archaeology uh, to establish to what extent uh, this recommended dietary advice was followed, where are the factors coming into play, and how does does this relate to group identity construction and negotiation? So um, I'm now going to give some examples of the ways in which reframing um, archaeological evidence in light of humoral theory might allow us new perspectives on dietary habits and how they change through time. And this will move us beyond these economic and simplistic uh, high and low status diet interpretations. So my first example is slaughter age. There's a proven decrease in slaughter age in uh, the early modern period compared to medieval times. And this is particularly true for pigs, birds and cattle. And for cattle, this has been explained as a shift away from traction to dairying. And veal is regarded as this sort of high quality item by the elite. It's a symbol of status. So if you look at the contemporary dietitian's advice, I've put up some nice quotes there. Um, Venet and Bord both regard veal as very nutritious and also the meat of other young animals. So could a greater importance placed on humoral theory because of this wider circulation of ideas, because of the pin printing press, help to explain this trend rather than these economic uh, interpretations? Uh, so my next uh, example is Thomas et al. in 2013 have shown in their study that there's tentative evidence for a shift towards the supply of male sheep, cattle and cockerels, all of which are possibly castrates, uh, to London markets in the early modern period. And this has been again interpreted in purely economic terms, so a shift away from agricultural practice from secondary products to a primary focus on meat. And if you look at Wagen in 1612, he says that that of a male doth far excel the flesh of a female. And he, along with others, believes that meat from castrated animals is the best and the most nutritious. So again, could this increased importance placed on humoral theory and wider circulation of ideas instead explain this trend? So venison. Braggate Park still is and always was part of the Deer Park. A nice little picture up there if you haven't been there. So I'm assuming the Greys ate shed loads of venison. Um, and venison is generally always found on elite sites. It's not generally eaten by town inhabitants. So it's seen as this iconic symbol of power and wealth. And in periods two and three, um, venison isn't generally recommended on nu nutritious grounds. Elliot says abstain from eating venison and Bord says I'm sure it's a lord's dish. Um, it's a meat for great men. Now this is a contradiction isn't it? So who's influencing who here? Um, I think actually probably showing your status is influencing the dietary writers here. Maybe humoral theory isn't playing as such as a bigger role. So moving on to the botanical evidence, uh, the most comprehensive studies for the period on a national scale were sort of done in the early 1990s. So these are comparatively outdated to the, to the zoo archaeology. And an example is the ABCD 
database. Um, this was done on sites excavated before 1992 and it discusses presence and absence. And in sort of general site reports we group uh, plant remains um, according to sort of broad groups, so cereals, fruit and nuts, um, other useful plants and agricultural weeds. But a lot of what we're putting in agricultural weeds is what we see as an agricultural weed. So not grass, for example, to the early modern periods uh, was used in potions to strengthen bones. So I'm going to make sure to also look at this sort of plant group and not ignore them, include everything. <coughs> Um, so in the most recent East Midlands assessment, there's a greater variety of useful garden plants in the early modern period compared to medieval times, uh, Mockington suggests. And I'm really interested in exploring this further. Um, can we see an increase in the variety of fruit and vegetable species and maybe a change in their relative abundance? And can this be attributed to changing humoral values? So an example is the humble bean. So at the beginning of the early modern period, it's seen as really nutritionally poor. Eliot says it makes the body ill. Uh, in the mid 1600s, Gerard's now thinking that it's making good blood. And uh, Parkinson says it's now mo used more as a food than as a medicine. And at the end of the uh, 1600s, it's really gained status. The elite are now loving it. So uh, Weston McCott says it's an excellent dish, beans and bacon, a constant treat at the country house. I have no complaints. So can I firstly sort of see this in the archaeological historical record? Is there increase in the variety of species, relative abundance? And can this sort of correlate to these changing humoral values? I'd be interested to see if this is linked at all to famine, as in times of famine people um, rely more on peas and beans, and maybe this has something to do with egging up its sort of status as people now need to use it. Uh, so another example is the melon. Now the melon, on the other hand, is seen as uh, nutritionally poor throughout the whole period. So at the start, Elliot again says it makes the body ill, bored, it makes ill humours, and at the end, West McCott says the flesh is crude and waterish in nourishment. Now the melons are actually seen as a dangerous food. You should stay away from it because it will putrefy in your stomach and cause corrupt juices to flow through it. And a death list circulated, and this included nobles on it. And Platina says, Pope Paul II suffered a fatal stroke after a supper of melons. So I've warned you all, that's all I'm saying. So, duh, 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 why on earth are we finding melon seeds in post-medieval uh, sites? So these criminal offences <laughs> have come from a 16th century rubbish dump at Finsborough Pavement, London. Well, the obvious answer is people are still eating them. So maybe the thrill of taboo breaking and danger attracted people to eating melons. But you laugh, but these psychological effects were real. People believed that they were dying from eating melons and that they were getting ill. This, this was true in their heads. Um, so to summarise, um, archaeological studies of food have taken this isolationist approach, so animal bones, plant remains have been studied separately, and historical information not integrated. And changes in the zoo archaeological record, and to an extent the archaeobotanical, as I've shown, have been found for the early modern period. And explanations are focused on economics and on simplistic social identity, high or low status, completely ignoring the contemporary mindset that's humoral theory. Now, humoral theory, health and diet were inextricably linked in the minds of commentators at the time, and a vast array of sources illustrates this. So what I want you to take home is humoral theory needs to be at the forefront of archaeological studies of food to better understand consumption and provide richer interpretations. And there's my acknowledgements. Thank you very much.